So 8.2 goes beyond Mendel because Mendel's genetics, or what's often called Mendelian genetics, is a little bit more on the simple side. It really allows us to see quite well how genetics works on a simple level, right? In terms of, okay, so you've got this idea of dominant, and you've got this idea of recessive, and you've got you know, these two laws that Mendel came up with, but sometimes things don't quite go as well in terms of that dominant and that recessive idea. And so sometimes things get a little bit more complicated. And so what 8.2 deals with is some of these other situations, things that we studied in sophomore year, things like incomplete dominance and codominance and multiple alleles are the things that we really hit on in sophomore year as well. So that should be review. And then also we get kind of these interesting ideas where one gene affects another gene or one trait is affected by several genes or one gene affects several traits. And again, it kind of gets messy. And so we can't do as much in terms of, you know, like a Punnett square predicting some of these things, but more of an idea of, of understanding that there's a little bit more at stake as an organism gets more complex. And then 8.3, which we'll get into possibly into tomorrow, probably into a Wednesday, deals with sex-linked traits in terms of how do things differ when you start talking about the X and Y chromosomes. And it also kind of mentions that not only do genes affect your traits, but so does the environment. Right? The environment plays consequences in how your genes are expressed. And so that's kind of where we're going on this 8.2 and on this 8.3. And so when Mendel was working with these, um, with these pea plants, they were that very simple system. As we just mentioned, they're genetically simple. Most traits controlled by a single gene. Each gene only had two alleles. One was dominant. The other one was completely recessive, right? So if you had the dominant allele, you saw the dominant trait, even if that recessive one was lurking around, the only way we saw the recessive trait is to have two of the recessive alleles. And so what it turns out, though, is that ultimately, although it does apply to some org uh, organisms, we saw with Mendel, right? I mean, that was real data. A lot of times, that relationship between genotype and phenotype and dominant and recessive is not quite that simple. And so our first case of showing things don't always work out quite as simple is this idea of incomplete dominance. And just as the name sounds, the one dominant one is, well, it's not completely dominant, right? It's incompletely dominant. So really, what does that mean? It means that, first of all, if your homozygous dominant or if your homozygous recessive, there is nothing different between an incomplete dominance and a regular dominance. For the homozygous dominant, for the homozygous recessive, everything is the same. It's only the heterozygous individual where things start to change. And it's that heterozygous condition where you get a blending of your two alleles. So, an example, if we have red flowers being incompletely dominant to white, right? Red flowers are incompletely dominant to white. Well, if I have two red alleles, I'm going to be a red plant, right? So big R, big R would be red. If I have two white alleles, little r, little r, I'm going to be white. But if I have one of each, if I'm heterozygous, so I have this allele for redness and I have an allele for whiteness, that is where we get this blending of a phenotype. So our heterozygous, you take a red and you take a white, and the red can't completely mask the white. You can think of it as kind of getting watered down, maybe. And so it ends up blending, and we get a third phenotype. So that's another characteristic of an incomplete dominance, where you get a third and different phenotype. So same thing with our genotypes, no different there, but we went from two to three phenotypes. And so if you think about why, remember that big R is making a protein that's going to create a red color, right? And in this case, we're making 50% less color for these guys right there. And that genotype, in this case, not just the simple genetics, is not strong enough to over completely um, mask the factor. It really doesn't create enough of the protein Typically, in those other heterozygous examples, that one dominant allele was able to produce enough of the product itself that everything was the same as if there had been two copies. In this case, in these examples, this dominant allele is just not able to keep up with what would normally be done. And so it's only making half the product, just like those other examples, but it's not good enough this time. And so we see the effect of getting 50% less color. And so, Sometimes you see it this way. Um, I don't really care which way you write it, but sometimes since it's incompletely dominant, you give each one their, their own colors. I typically reserve that more for codominance, which is kind of the next idea. So we can see an example of our flowers there. So on this case, there is no test crosses or anything like that, right? 
Because if I said, okay, so you have a red flower, is it homozygous or heterozygous? Well, if you know it's incompletely dominant, it would have to be heter or it be homozygous, right? So it's not like that test crop example where you say, oh, I don't know which one it is, we have to mate it with a, re with a recessive one. It doesn't apply to incomplete dominance. And so just another example showing our true breeding red with a true breeding white. You discover 100% pink flowers. If we set up a Punnett square, right? Big R, big R versus little r, little r. Gives you 100% big R, little r's. Then if we took our pink flowers, let them self-pollinate. So big R, little r on the top, big R, little r on the bottom. You're going to get big R, big R, big R, little r, big R, little r, little r, little r. In other words, you're going to get 50% red. Sorry, 25% red, one fourth, right? 50% heterozygous pink and 25% white. So a one to two to one ratio. And just to point out on that, because if you read the chapter closely at the beginning, it talked about this, this kind of early idea of blending. And this is a really similar idea to what a lot of people kind of prior to Mendel thought that when two parents' genetics come together, it just kind of blends them together. But the reason why this isn't the same as blending is this idea right here. Yes, the red and the white blended to form pink, but if you just merely blend, you can't unblend yourself, right? I mean, think about paint. You can take red and white and make pink, but you can't make, take pink and pink and make red and white again from it, right? And so this idea, the idea that, okay, so those colors did blend and they mixed, but there must be more to it because in the next generation, yeah, we still have some pink, but we restored our red and our white again makes it a little bit different than that blending example. So codominance, another exception to the rule, and just like with incomplete dominance, it's really just the heterozygous that's going to cause a difference from this versus just normal dominant and recessive. Your homozygous dominant is still going to act the same way, your homozygous recessive is still going to act the same way, but it's adding a third phenotype as the heterozygous is going to be a result of both the allele because they both want to affect the phenotype, which is why we call them codominant. They both want to assert their dominance, and so they're both going to show up. They're not going to back down. They're not going to blend like incomplete dominance is either. And so not blended, um, a classic example that we'll go through in a couple minutes is the ABO blood typing, which is an example of, of codominance and also multiple alleles, which we'll talk about more. Um, and so that one has three alleles. But with the codominance, the idea is, okay, so I'm dominant allele number one, I'm going to produce my phenotype. And the other one says, I'm dominant allele number two, I'm going to produce my phenotype. And so they both show up if you're a heterozygous. Um, one of the classic examples you might remember from sophomore year is, I believe they're called Roan cattle, R-O-A-N. And I can't remember which one's dominant. Maybe red is dominant. Or red, and white, red and white are co-dominant, so they're both there. And so one would be if you have the two red alleles, you're going to be kind of this rusty red cattle. And if you have the two white alleles, you're going to be the white cattle. And if you're heterozygous, you have the red allele, you have the white allele. And so you're going to get red and white patches. Or at other times, it almost looks like one solid color, but if you go and if you grab a handful and yank that hair out of that cow and then run like crazy, and then look at the hair in your hand, you'd see red and white hairs not blended together, but so close together that from a distance it looks like separate colors. All right? So the point is they're both going to show up because they're both dominant. Now in, in blood typing, you have three alleles, which your book also talked about an idea called multiple alleles. And they talked about blood typing and they also <laughs> talked about rabbit fur, I think, right? Well, one color was like the chinchilla color and the gray color and the white color, etc. Multiple alleles just means you have more than two options, which remember Mendel said two alleles, right? One dominant, one recessive, so that's why this goes beyond what he saw. And so in your blood, there are three alleles, so you don't necessarily, how many alleles do you have for blood? You can still only have two, right? You still only have two of each gene, two alleles of each gene, right? There's three alleles possible, but you still have a genotype that only has two of them. So make sure you understand that with multiple alleles doesn't mean that you have three alleles for blood in you. It's just there's three things to choose from. So you might be big A, big A, or big B, big B, or I, I, 
or big A, big B, or big A, I, or big B, I. But either way, you still just have the two alleles, right? So multiple just means there's more to choose from. I think that rabbit example, the rabbit coat color in your note or in your book had four alleles to choose from. So in this case, the reason why it's also codominant is that A and B are codominant to each other. They're not going to back down. They're each going to make their product. And I is a recessive allele. It's recessive to both A and recessive to B. This also explains why you can't just receive any type of blood for most of you. And why if you donate blood, it has to be appropriately categorized and labeled because if you're one type of blood and you're given a different type of blood because of the proteins being produced from those genes, your body basically will try to destroy that blood that comes in if it doesn't recognize it. And I'll explain that more in a second. Well, couldn't you then be like a universal Okay, donor? so we'll get to that in a second. So hold that thought. So, A, A B, and I'm just kind of, kind of ignoring the I, so I'll just call that A, B. Um, they're going to produce both antigens. So basically what happens if you type A blood, if you have a capital A, a dominant A, it's going to produce A antigens. If you have a capital B, it's going to produce B antigens. If you have an A and a B, it's going to produce both. both. A and B antigens, right? Because both are dominant. And if you have an I, you're not going to produce any antigens. Okay? So, the I allele is recessive to both. So what does this actually look like then when we start to figure it out? There are four phenotypes for blood. You can be type A, you can be type B, you can be type AB, and you can be type O. And we're ignoring the RH factor, which is, gives you the positive and the negatives for now. Um, We'll come back to that maybe at a different time. So if I was going to be blood type A, there's two possibilities for my phenotype. I can be homozygous, which would be big A, big A, or I could be what's considered the heterozygous A type, which is big A, which is dominant, and I, which is recessive. So either way, I have the A type blood. And so if I have the capital A, I have A antigens on the surface of my red blood cells. A antigens on the surface of my red blood cells. Now, if I have type A blood and I have type A antigens, I'm going to produce type B, or I should say anti-B, antibodies. In other words, if you have type A blood, your body is familiar with the fact that you have these A antigens in your body, right? But if it sees a type B antigen, it's going to see that, and it's going to mount an attack, and it's going to fight those B antigens with the anti-B antibodies. Antibodies, part of your immune system, we'll learn about later on in the year. Right? So it's going to attack it. So if you stick B-type blood in this person, these antibodies are going to tear that B blood apart, which you don't want happening inside of you. Right? And so, well, we don't really worry about the donor status for these two. If I'm B-type blood, I can be homozygous B or heterozygous B, just like A. So what kind of antigens? B, right? My B allele, whether I have two or one of them, is going to make B antigens. Well, if I have B antigens, what kind of antibodies do we have? Anti-A. So if I'm a B-type blood and someone puts A blood in me, my A anti-A antibodies are going to rip that A blood apart because they only want B. If I have AB, there's only one genotype. What is it? Okay, so AB. Right, I, A, I, B. So there's only one way to do it, but they're codominant. So my A allele is going to make A antigens, and my B allele is going to make B antigens. Right. So you have both A and B antigens. So what about antibodies? I'm producing A's and I'm producing B's. Remember, anti-A's and anti-A's will break or will attack A's, and anti-B's will attack B's. I'm making both A's and B's, so do I want anything attacking them? No. No. So you have no antibodies. Okay. No antibodies. Now, if you have no antibodies, what does that tell you about donation status in terms of... You can receive anything. You can receive anything. You're the universal recipient. Because you have no antibodies in your blood, because your blood's already making both the antibodies. Right? So, you're the universal recipient, which means you are very easy if you need a blood transfusion or things like that. Um, you can pretty much take any blood. 
Then if you have O-type blood, well, you're going to have both of the recessive alleles. Little i, little i. Well, if you have little i, little i, what kind of antigens are those little i's making? The A allele makes the A antigen. The B allele makes the B antigen. Do I have an A or a B? No, so they don't make any antigens. Well, if they don't make any antigens, how about my antibodies? Anti-A and anti-B. Since they're not normally in your body, right, your immune system is going to attack any A's or B's that it finds because it's not supposed to be there. Which means, what's that going to do in terms of your donor status or donation status? Donor. You can give them. You are the universal donor. However, in terms of receiving, you can only receive O blood. You can't put an A blood in someone because it'll attack the A. You can't put a B in someone that's O because it'll attack the B. You can't put A, B in them because it'll attack the A and the B. Right? So these people can only receive O-type blood, yet they can donate to anyone. So if you're O-type blood, they really ask you to, to consider donating because since it has no antigens, you throw O-type blood in any of these other three people, and these antibodies aren't going to have anything to fight because there aren't any antigens being introduced in that blood. Right? So that's a simple idea of blood typing. Um, you can, of course, set up pi and square problems with them, which I'll write one on the board here in a minute, but not really. Uh, you should be able to do them. It's just not going to take much time to do it. It's the same as any other ones. If I say a, uh, a man is homozygous A-type blood, you would say, oh, that means he's IA, IA, right? And if I say that the female is type AB blood, IA, IB, then you just fill in your pun and square. This one would be, I'm just doing the letters now, AA, AA, AB, AB. In other words, 50% type A blood, 50% type B blood. Right? If you had someone that was a female that was AI and a male that was BI, and if the problem said what kind of offspring could they produce, well, AB, AI, BI, II, AB blood, A blood, B blood, O blood, 25% of each. All right? And by the way, if you get if you get a combination, and let's see if I can do it a second. Let's call this um, we got AA and A. So if you do this. You get a homozygous A, A, A. You get a heterozygous A, a homozygous A, and a heterozygous A. In terms of phenotypes, although I have two different genotypes, in terms of phenotypes, 100% A type blood. So just simple, fun, and square problems. The only difference is you got to remember that A and B are dominant, and that there's a third allele, that lowercase i. Yeah, sure. Um, when they test you for blood type, do they um, distinguish? between AA and AI when they tell you, or they, they um, just tell you type A? That's a good question. I'm not quite sure. I think it depends. If you like actually go to the doctor and they like do all of it, you can probably, but a lot of times you just buy like a little kit, yeah. and it just pricks your finger, and all it does is tells you like if you're a, like if you have or don't have the antigen, so then it helps you rule right. out. Right, and I'm actually going to do a, a, a lab like that in my CSI class in winter that's based on this principle. And so I think... In terms of receiving blood and donating blood, it only matters as far as being like A, B, C, or D. If you want to go genetically further than that and try to figure out genetic combinations, or, I mean, you can actually use this as a like precursor to like a DNA test. It's very expensive to test someone's DNA, like in a crime scene. But if you find a blood sample, the first thing you could do, or even like a paternity test, right? I mean, it's still, it's DNA, it's expensive. Well, you could first of all just say, okay, so the kid's this, the mom's this, and the supposed dad is this, is it even possible for that dad or that mom to make this kid's blood type? And if the answer is no, don't waste a thousand bucks running a DNA test kind of thing. So in those cases, maybe it would be beneficial to try to figure out heterozygous for homozygous, but for the most part, I would say it's just a blood type. Yeah. So negatives and positives deal with an RH factor, and RH was named after the rhesus monkey, um, because that's what it was discovered in. Um, and it just kind of gets away from this whole genetic thing, but we actually will talk about that down the road. Uh, you can be positive or negative, which means there's actually 
eight blood types then, because you can have these four, and you can be a positive or a negative. All right, um, kind of moving on here, a couple other non-Mendelian types. You've got this idea called pleiotropy, and most genes are pleiotropic. And what do we mean by that? We mean that one gene affects more than one phenotypic character. In other words, what we've been kind of simplifying with those pea plants is, okay, I have this gene for color, and that gene only affects the color of the flower. And I have this gene for seed color, and that gene only affects the seed color. And I have this gene for height in the pea plants, and that gene for height only affects the height. But a lot of times, it kind of spills over more than that. So one gene affects more than one trait. So let's say you have some gene that, that's a growth kind of gene, right? Well, that growth kind of gene, it's going to affect a lot of different areas, right? Because more than one thing might deal with that growth. And so it's not just going to change one thing, but it could change a whole bunch of things. And when you start to get into human genetics, you see that a lot more, that things are a little bit more confusing. You change this gene from dominant to recessive, and it doesn't just change this one phenotype, but it changes this and this and this and this. And we call that pleiotropic. And so dwarfism or achondroplasia, for those of you who remember that from sophomore year, uh, is, a, is a case where, again, you're changing one gene, but there's a whole bunch of phenotypic characters, and you might just say, no, it's just tall versus short. But if you look at it a little bit more, it's more than just a height difference, right? There's other things going on there um, in that dwarfism that's changing, you know, not just the height, but it's changing proportions and things like that as well. And so again, one gene, just a dominant allele, one gene can, can lead to a whole bunch of differences. Um, gigantism is another example of that. A uh, one gene, but if that one gene happens to lead, maybe to the, I don't know exactly how gigantism works, but if it leads to more the formation of more growth hormone, and that growth hormone gets sent to all these other cells and continues to tell things to grow and divide and divide, right? It's not just having one part grow, but more multiple parts growing, and it leads to things like Andre the Giant, who coincidentally, I was watching Princess Bride as I was working on that, so that was just random, but he's big. Oh, yes. Mrs. Kitts said um, it could happen by getting a tumor on your pituitary gland. It could, yes. Um, but then the question is what caused that tumor? And sometimes it could be a genetic cause to cause something to continue to be released. But you're right, it can also deal with tumors, which ne isn't necessarily a genetic thing, then it would be more of a cell cycle problem that we talked about in the last chapter. Last couple things, well, a couple things about the inheritance. Again, just to see some pun and squares here. So this achondroplasia is a dominant allele, which we don't always see genetic disorders that are dominant, but it is. In other words, this person is, has a chondroplasia, right, this form of dwarfism, and little a, little a would be a normal person, right? And so, in this case, this would be two people with dwarfism, right? And so we could do Punnett squares between them and kind of figure out the inheritance and, and what we'd expect. So here's the, the, I guess I should say, the normal size parent, and here would be the parent with a chondroplasia. And so we can fill in our Punnett square, and we would see that we have a 50% chance of dwarfism passing on, and there's a 50% chance of having a normal heighted child. So a one-to-one -one ratio, 50%. In this case, we have two people with dwarfism, and we have a little bit of a different combination. Anyone remember what happens if you have two capital letters in a chondroplasia? What's that? They die. They, they don't survive. They have to have one recessive A. Oh, and so this one, actually, well, we'll see that in a second. So we've got big A, big A, we have two big A, little A's, we have a little A, little A. This one is actually not going to be able to survive. Okay? Um, these two are going to be dwarfism. dwarfism, right? So that's lethal. we got two that are dwarfism. And this one? Normal. Normal height. So it is possible for two people with achondroplasia and very short height to actually have a full-sized child. And so now, it's a little bit weirder as you interpret these results, because notice the numbers here. 67% dwarf and 33% normal. Well, why out of three, right? Why two out of three and one out of three when there are four squares? Well, that one's lethal, so it's not going to survive. It's not probably even going to be born. And so, basically, you're only producing three offspring. So now you're taking your offspring out of three, so two out of three, dwarfism, one out of three, normal. Yeah. If that one were to live, is it like, a, would it 
Would it be like just an extreme form of kind of pollution? You know, I don't know enough about it um, to know what the expectancy like, is why, in there. Why is it lethal? I mean, I understand like genetically if it's sometimes if it's a big thing, it is So lethal, it must have something to do with it. it needs to have some of that recessive one. Because remember, it's producing something, right? This is mm -hmm. producing something. Um, and so you would need, maybe it's just producing too much of it when you have the two copies, and so you at the very least need to have one of the recessive ones to kind of mellow it out. I don't know a whole lot about it. From my understanding, I don't think this child would ever make it to birth, but I don't know that for a fact. Yeah. Um, so since if you have the big A and big A, you don't survive, and since it's dominant, is that kind of a way of keeping like everything from dwarfs? So if it's dominant, um, then there's like yeah, so that, that's one thing. You do see that with a lot of dominant traits. And so you could tie it in and say it's kind of this, I don't know, safety check kind of thing to try to prevent it. Because if you did allow those to survive, you're right, it would change things and you would see a lot higher percentage of this dominant allele surviving. So as it is, you have only the heterozygotes surviving. So you could look into that and, and possibly make that claim. Um. Well, so potentially, couldn't it just be like, oh, um, two like parents like that would just have a much harder time like getting pregnant then? Two parents like this? Yeah, like two um, brothers, <coughs> I guess, dwarf parents. Um, I mean, it's just like they're having a harder time having kids that work out, right? Because mm -hmm. of the lethal thing. Um, because I mean, it's not affecting like twenty five percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I guess twenty. I mean, they have a twenty five percent chance of survival. I don't think you can necessarily surviving. say that. Like, yeah. if you look at little people, big world, they had like healthy kids. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, you gotta remember that even in in I don't want to use the word normal, but I guess it will. In a normal situation, right? I mean, it's not a hundred percent chance that okay, so you form the zygote that it's going to survive. I mean, when you look at the miscarriage rate, it's probably in the ten to twenty percent range. Yeah. So is that that much different than that? I, it's just a different situation. So I don't know if I would necessarily say it's harder for them to, to get offspring. Right, so does dwarfism just deal with height? Is there any there's, on genes that can tell height? There's different types of dwarfism, first of all, and this is just one type of the dwarfism. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how, what this does, but it is caused by one gene. Um, but obviously it's affecting a lot of things, right? And that's why it's under this idea of pliotropic, because one gene, you know, it's not as simple as just saying, oh yeah, that one gene made this person shorter, right? There's a lot more at stake than that. So I don't, I don't know really what leads to that, what leads to that whole thing. Can you just, can it randomly mutate? There are always exceptions. Yeah, you could have a mutation and it could be a non, um, a non-inherited one as well. Oh, wait, so then my question was like, the only way that you're going to get like a birth dwarf is from a parent who's a dwarf. So does that mean that dwarfs turn around for all time? There is always the chance of a mutation. And so although this is looking at the inheritance of it, it is possible for two normal sized parents to have a, a, a kind of pelagic child um, through, a, through a mutation of that gene. All right, and then the last couple points. Epistasis was another thing that your book mentioned. And this is when one gene completely masks another gene. And so if you look in a, an example of mice, coat color, there's two separate genes to give the mice their coat color. Um, you have, first of all, big C and little c. If you have a big C, it produces pigment. Pigment's what gives you color. And if you have a little c, it produces no pigment. However, you also have a big B and a little b. Here's another gene, right? Big B makes more pigment. Little b makes less pigment. Now let's say I'm an individual mouse and I have big B, big B, right? Mr. Krebs has big B, big B. Well, you'd say, oh man, he's going to be a really black mouse. But then if I told you he has a little c, little c on his other gene, he's not going to make any pigment. So despite this gene saying, oh, I'll make the blackest pigment you can make, the other gene says, well, I already turned you off, <laughs> right? And so again, one gene is basically regulated another gene. Your book gave the example of Labrador retrievers for this, the same idea. There's again a gene that tells you the amount of pigment, but there's also a gene that says, well, are you gonna make the pigment or not? And if you're not making the pigment, it doesn't matter what that other gene is going to make. And so a little c, little c is gonna be an albino no matter what the other B allele says. And so, 
we can kind of see that worked out. We get all these different combinations in there.